our next speaker is Professor Doug Jasman, the, the head of the Social Progress and Education program here at Sunway, uh, at Sunway University. He's also on the board of Sunway University, so he's also my boss and my employee at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so, he, we all know that he has taken on very brave positions on the question of how you advance educational progress in Malaysia. And as a person who has been continually thinking about it, I am very pleased to invite him now to tell us what new viewpoints he has now on rejuvenating the education system in Malaysia. Professor Dr. Uh, thank you, Prof. Wu. Actually, I'm not his boss. <laughs> I take instructions from him. <laughs> now, actually, when we started preparing for today's seminar, uh, this was about three months ago, uh, we picked these speakers and we picked these titles, and I thought this would be appropriate. But actually, what I wanted to talk three months ago is very different from what I wanted to speak today uh, simply because of what happened in the recent budget. I think you all are aware of examinations. So the budget dimension has changed a lot of things in what I want to say. You know? So from one time when I was very optimistic about a lot of things, so now I'm not sure about certain things. But uh, I'm... What I want to do today is I want to offer my own views on how we should go forward in order to to continue to progress and in order to uh, help the country become an education hub. Because as you know, uh, I'm speaking in this language simply because there have been massive budget cuts. Uh, for example, I was the Vice Chancellor of Israel Malaya. Uh, the recent budget announcement for 2016 has been the biggest cut in the history of the university. Uh, it amounted to 27% of the operating budget, uh, translating to 174 million. And the next one that has been badly hit is UITM, with a cut of more than 500 million over. That's one. And secondly, I'm very sure the National Higher Education uh, Study Fund, which is the PTPTL loan, will be further cut. And as you know, lastly, it has been cut. And this means that more students will not be able to study in the universities because, as you know, they needed these funds. And the PTPTL loan is even not enough to pay for the tuition fees. So we are in a difficult situation in trying to explain how we survive this thing, you know. But let me just keep my mind how we can go forward to this. I think the solution is not going to be easy, but for those institutions who are willing to try, I think there's a way forward in all this. And I am also quite sure of one thing, if the oil crisis were to continue and the Malaysian government income doesn't recover, there will be further cuts next year. And that is a sure way to make sure that at least the number of institutions in this country will be for the dream. Okay, but I think I'm quite sure uh, we can still have seminars in this room <laughs> <laughs> because uh, the Sunway system, the Sunway philosophy, is quite different from the other private university. And you may ask me what is the difference. I'll explain to you at the end. Of course, here, you know, our country, our Prime Minister, our higher education minister is talking about creating education hub. We are not alone, we are competing globally, you know. So, we have to understand that higher education is a very competitive business. Everybody wants students. And I'm not so sure, but I, I used to talk to a professor from Australia. The income from international fees is, I think, number one or number two for Australia. So, everybody wants students. And not only that, everybody wants good students. At least you will see from the 
Perang strategi pengingin tinggi negara di National Higher Education Strategy Plan It lists the 100,000 students by certain years so It talks about good students But are we getting good foreign students on the this country? And that is the problem In the first place, we don't meet the 100,000 target And they already talked about going to 200,000 but some of these students are like what Lauren said, ghost students. <laughs> now, I'm boring the word. I didn't create that word here. And of course, uh, you know, you, you have countries uh, like Hong Kong and so on, they have done extremely well. It's a rich country, they invest in education. And uh, Hong Kong is a symbol of success in higher education, no doubt about that. They are uh, several of your universities are in the top 100 and in the top 50 in the world. So, so, so they can put out advertisement like this and people will believe it. Isn't it? When I talk about uh, sustainable uh, model for <coughs> education hub and so on, I think the best model to take, I mean, I, I was trying to pick one model, I think we cannot uh, deny the fact that uh, Silicon Valley, and in particular, you have Stanford University, which sits right in the middle of it, uh, is, is the best model to take, in my opinion. Why? Because if you look at Stanford University, see what it has produced. 22 Nobel laureates, and so on and so on, with $20 billion investment. Okay? In our national higher education time, we also talk about Nobel laureates. You know? But I'm still waiting who. <laughs> I'm not so sure yet. And uh, you just imagine, uh, in terms of innovation, entrepreneurship, I think there's no doubt, uh, you know, a lot of very well-known uh, companies, big, big companies in IT, uh, healthcare, and so on, has come out of uh, Stanford University. And it is amazing that if uh, it is a country by itself, it will rank, uh, what, number 10 or something like that, in the world. So Stanford University is a economic powerhouse if you think about it. So really, if you want to talk about creating education hub, you, hopefully we all think about creating more Stanford universities, isn't it? Or maybe it is not the level of Stanford University, maybe 20% of Stanford University first. And that's what I have been trying to advocate to the uh, management of uh, Sunway University. I think we must do things that will go take us to that rather than just trying to be in another university with uh, student numbers that can sustain the operation and so on. We won't get anywhere. Yeah? But Malaysia, if they have two or three Stanford University, that's, a, that's really good enough. You know? okay? And not only that, uh, not only in entrepreneurship and innovation, in social innovation also. And the list is uh, incredible. So, so really, uh, if we want to talk about uh, what kind of model and so on, I think uh, if we take the performance of Stanford University on what they have done and so on, and how they were able to be so successful and so on, that I think is the right model. And this was what I was trying to do in UM too, that at the end of the day, UM must compete with the best in the world, you know. Uh, but Honestly, to run a public news simulation is not easy. I don't want to uh, tell you all my problems before, but I'm glad I'm no more there. <laughs> I, I'm happy to be alive. I thank God that every day. <laughs> that I survived five years there. But I tell you, it's not easy. And I, I'm very, very sympathetic to the current BC. Because he's going to get hit from everywhere. And they will not blame the government, but they will blame him for the lower budget that they're getting. So my God, uh, I hope he will survive. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, these are the key things about Stanford. In whatever they do, they want to do the best. And not only in attracting academics and students and so on, but in terms of entrepreneurship, innovation and so on. Look, I am beginning to repeat this word, entrepreneurship innovation, that is the only way we can go forward, honestly. If we want to create nation into an education hub. Because I can't think of any other way what we can do now, you know. After, after the budget 
announcement, uh, I was trying to say, what can UM do? I come back to the same conclusion. UM has no way out but to pursue this path. It's going to be tough, but that's the only way. And I explain to you why. Now, I have to talk about these famous uh, plans that have been announced before and how much we have deviated from it. So this is the National Higher Education uh, okay, uh, Higher Education Plan. Okay, so it says there you see here uh, uh, two higher education institution, which is university, must be in the top one hundred, three in the top one hundred, and two must be in the top fifty. Do we have any university in Malaysia which is in the top hundred? Is there or not? We haven't got any single university in the top 100. <clears throat> you all know if you go around to the university campuses and you tell the academics, hey, I want to make this university into the top 100. How many academics were likely to be saying that, yeah, we agree with you? But, you know, this is the problem with the system because we are so divided whether we should be doing this or not. Some will say, no, no, it's not important we do that. We have to educate more students so that uh, they get uh, education and so on. We must do a good job in teaching. Okay? So, it is no wonder that you find very, very few West Africans who are willing to say that, you know? Because I think that it's almost a sure way that it's going to be sacrificed. Anybody who says, any vice chancellor who says that, he won't be wrong. Okay. okay, the ministers, is he brave enough to say these things? No, he won't be fully committed into saying this because, again, he may be sacrificed too. So, this is the problem because we have so many people against this, and yet, from my mind, and I think from those who, who, who who thinks, uh, I mean, how we move forward, how we should develop and so on. That this is the way forward, actually. So, so these are some of the challenges. Huh? And we must have uh, 100,000 quality international students, 100,000 PhD. This, I think we only have about 40 now. Huh? <laughs> we must have innovative global products, nation Nobel laureates. Very beautiful document, right? <laughs> and we are here now, yeah? roughly halfway. Do you think we'll get a Nobel Prize winner? Maybe. Maybe, yeah? Important. <laughs> Innovative global products? Okay, so, so it's difficult to answer all this. Anyway, this is a document that the government has released and this is how we should go forward. Anyway. And then here is a speech by our Prime Minister and this is uh, April 7th of uh, this year when he launched this thing, the, uh, the Malaysian uh, Education Blueprint. Okay, this is sort of trying to reinforce the PSPT ideas now. And what does he say? You read this. I uh, make this part bold in red and he says that uh, universities will be granted increased autonomy under the blueprint, including increased financial autonomy. <laughs> and not only that, he said, while well, public universities must get an extra four billion on their own. <laughs> the recent budget cuts and so on amounts to less than two billion. So, anybody from the public university here, <laughs> you have another two billion to be cut. <laughs> so, this is reality. Uh, I think when the Prime Minister gave this speech earlier on, he had this already in mind, it's already been planned, and the cuts are going to come, but only that the public university never believed that it will come. <laughs> this is the truth. Of course, uh, this doesn't affect Sunway, it doesn't affect the other private university, it, uh, it will affect Sunway only by way of the PTPTN loans. <coughs> and that's why I have some recommendation for Sunway too, that you shouldn't be too dependent on PTPT and loan. Okay? But, look, you can monetize your assets. The Prime Minister said this here uh, in uh, April 7th. And in another speech here, he says the same thing. 
I, I'll come back to all this. And this is uh, in UPM when he was speaking to a uh, majlis bersama warga pendidikan tinggi to all the academic staff, students of uh, uh, universities. Okay, he said he wants urge public universities to find their own method in sourcing finances without relying too much on the government. The problem, I think, there's nobody from the public university here today. You know? <laughs> I'm addressing the wrong crowd. <laughs> but I will tell you something. There's a lot of panic in the public university now. Uh, I, I know some vice chancellors have spoken to them, I've spoken to the professors. They have no clue on how to manage the situation. You know, they, they have no clue at all. So there is no one single vice chancellor who is smiling to the education that can be sure. Because they have no clue. I have communicated with some of the Ministry of Malaya board members. They also have no clue. The only thing they tell me is, oh, we will organize teams to go out and uh, raise more endowments. And you know that is the most difficult thing to do in nation studies. Nations are not so philanthropic, isn't it? Not like the Americans do. Huh? So, and here the, the Prime Minister said, we have to assist the government to find financial resources in managing the universities. Therefore, I hope universities can look for ways in monetizing its asset. Double. In April and in September, he repeated that. Monetizing the assets. What does this mean? Sorry? Some buildings. <laughs> A lot of the public universities are built on very big campuses. <clears throat> the University of Malaya, in where it is now, the main campus has about 800 acres. It has 1,000 acres in Johor, it has uh, 200 acres in Gemas, and so on. So, monetize these assets, that's what they are saying. UPM is sits on a 6,000 acre piece of land. Okay, uh, if I'm not mistaken, UPM sits on 2,000 acres. So they have plenty of land. So the PM is telling them to do it, but the problem is nobody knows how to do it. <laughs> and I will explain to you why, why they don't know what to do. Okay, this is what the Prime Minister said earlier, and this is a nation education screen. There are this thing called the outcomes and the enablers, there are six enablers and four outcomes. I think it's good to just see what are the keywords here, which is financial sustainability. <coughs> this is the Malaysian education blueprint for higher education. Empowered governance, that means more autonomy. Innovation ecosystem. Okay? So they expect us to be more innovative, produce and uh, do research where the research finding will produce products that you can sell and so on and so on. <coughs> Global prominence, okay? Get into ranking, show that our universities are highly ranked and so on. Globalize online learning and transform HD delivery. This is interesting, online learning. It is not so uh, widespread yet, but honestly speaking, uh, after so many years in education, this is one line where you actually the universities can make money you know, if they want. Because there are so many people out there who need education but never had a chance to go to university. At the moment, the biggest player is only the open university. But there is room for more. So, so, but unfortunately, we have an agency called the Malaysian Qualifications Agency, MQA. They are so rigid. They are mainly run by public university professors, and that's the biggest problem. Isn't it? <laughs> I mean, the Ministry of Higher Education also is run, being run by so many academics from the public university. So, if ever the minister were to ask me how we can change things, replace some of these people with people from industry or private universities. Because everybody is from the government university, and they never have to worry about making money, you know. They never have to worry about making money because in the past they would assume the government must give us money. Uh, but this is different with Sunway and so on because here nobody gives them money. Uh, there must be some brains inside Sunway industry which must think about how to 
recruit students, make money and balance the budget. Because if they are in financial trouble, nobody will help them. And this reason why we also have now many uh, university colleges, colleges or even universities which are which have to be sold because they can't balance the budget, you know? Okay. And these are the numbers that we have. I was told now there is already a moratorium until 2017. The government is not allowing any more building of universities except if the top 100 universities in the world wants to come to Malaysia and build their campus, that will still be allowed. But I don't know which top 100 universities wants to do that. You know? But the moratorium is for the rest. The top 100 universities that they want to come and build campuses will still be welcome. <clears throat> okay, I have mentioned about this. Okay, and this is the budget card recently. And I think if the oil crisis uh, were to persist, this could be a straight line here next year. <laughs> that be very very serious for everybody. Okay, and just to tell you, these are published things. Huh? I didn't calculate it myself. Uh, these are the change. You see, the University of Malaya is down by twenty seven percent. All right. Only one university, UKM, uh, has an increase of 5%. You all must be wondering why. And you'll be wondering whether I know the answer or not. Right? <laughs> you think I know the answer? Yes. yes. I cannot tell you. <laughs> I know the answer, but I cannot tell you. Because I think there's a recording now. <laughs> and this will be put on YouTube. I don't want to tell the answer. But if, but if not because of that thing, it will be negative too. But there's a reason I don't tell you the answer. Because I want to still be in some way. <laughs> and you look at some of the big cuts, uh, UITM here, where is it? Uh, <clears throat> Where is your idea? Ah, 23, second biggest. And if you, uh, your ITM, you look here, you know, for 2.6 billion to 1, one is a 600 million over cut. Oh, God. This one, I don't know whether the government is miscalculated or not because this can be very sensitive. And you know why I'm saying that? I don't want to explain the same. The clue is good I, enough. I, sorry? The clue is good enough. Yeah, okay. Because this one, I tell you, it will be very hot. So, so, so these are the sort of cuts we are getting. Yeah. Impact of the budget. Uh, how do I see the impact? Okay, major setback for public uses as none was prepared. None of the university vice chancellors versus all was prepared for this. They thought this would never happen. But now it has really happened. That's why there's a sense of panic and what to do. And I even met one vice chancellor and when I talked to him what he's going to do and so on. Actually he said he told me that in life we never thought we have to raise money. I thought I'm supposed to just run the university. Is what this vice chancellor said, you know? And of course he doesn't know what to do now. <laughs> Set back in achieving the PSPTN. I'm very sure the PSPTN now will be having problems to be achieved in some of the targets. Because, for example, now, you know, <clears throat> do you think there's motivation to go and recruit more international students? Because the first thing to be cut is budget to go and recruit international students. Budget for advertisement. All that they will definitely be cut. Because the first priority is that the vices will do, make sure every staff must be paid their salary. And that will be like 60-70% already. And not only that, contract staff, they will go now. That's for sure. Okay. Uh, in fact, the administrative contract staff, uh, beginning of this year, already has been given letters that by the end of the year, their contract will not be renewed. And that's a few hundred of them. This will be like uh, research uh, assistants, uh, science officers, and so on, which are on contract. Where there was not enough post, so they were on contract. All will definitely go, but there's no money for that. Okay, so that's the situation. 
public universities are told by the minister do not increase the fees. And you know why he said this, isn't it? Because the minute the fees are in increased, immediate demonstration by students. That's for sure, I can guarantee you that. You see, and uh, the flare up will be everywhere. So don't touch student fees, whatever you do. By the way, you know, like the students hostel fees in UN, it has not been raised in the last 10 years. Yeah, you know, it has not been raised for the last 10 years. So whatever fees was touched at that time is still the same amount today. So in other words, the university is heavily subsidizing it. And the cost of staying in the hostel, we will eat food and everything is 10 ringgit a day. Now my dinner is more than 10 ringgit. <laughs> You know, I have dinners alone normally, you know, but my wife don't live with me. And you'll be wondering why. <laughs> <laughs> my close friends are laughing because they know the reason why. Okay? But uh, it is very difficult to have dinner which is less than 10 ringgit this day, isn't it? You know, uh, breakfast is possible. You just take roti canna and that's it. <laughs> Any ads on will be more than that, so it's for what movies. Okay, public universities will run into massive deficits and the University of Malaya will have to eat into its savings now. That's the only way. But University of Malaya is the only university that has got big savings. The rest of the universities <coughs> don't have. Uh, some universities, they may have enough saving to last three months, something like that. So how do we survive? Okay. Uh, less money for research. So the research university, the, the six research university will be affected. <coughs> less money for PT, PTM, which means less students will be going to study in the universities, right? So more will be out there. Maybe more will go into TVET. Because uh, the budget for TVET has been increasing. In fact, uh, the Minister of Sports, uh, Heidi Damaludin even say, oh now the budget for TVET has been increased so more students will be encouraged to go and do that lah. And which means uh, private universities will, will have less budget. Okay. And uh, many private institutions will run into financial difficulty. Uh, and, and even before this, Quite a number is already in trouble, and some have been sold, some have been merged, and so on. So, so this is the maybe this is a way to really weed out uh, or survival of the fetus, isn't it? So maybe this is the process. So, so just wait for six months and see which are to be sold or to be wiped down. Okay. And of course, we will see a new steady state. I don't know what is that steady state going to be, but I think. Uh, the players will be much, much reduced and I think even the foreign branch campuses, some of them will close and go back. There are many branch campuses, right? You know, you have Newcastle University from UK, Southampton, Nottingham and so on. And a lot of them is dependent on all these things, you know. And the foreign branch campuses charge fish much, much higher than the local private universities anyway. And a lot of problems has cropped up in the private universities because in the last one year, a lot of private universities have increased tuition fees by 30%. And yet the cut by PTPTN has been 20 to 30%. So PTPTN loan for students gone down and fees has gone up. So only uh, students whose parents uh, can afford it will be able to make it. But the rest, even the PTPTN loan is not enough to pay for the tuition fees. This is the problem. <coughs> Establishing new income stream. Now, you will be wondering some of this why I say this, but let me tell you, I've been in education very long. I've thought about this subject. What, how can universities do it? And these are my thoughts. Okay? The government has spent billions of uh, ringgit or dollars into research in universities and so on. But our professors, our academy is not good at all in business. I mean, totally hopeless. <laughs> the academic, you know. Um, 
They are happy to do good research, publish in very high quality journals, but that's it. They keep the research. So there must be a way on how we can actually uh, look for all this quality research, quality products, and market it. Now, there are already all these innovation agencies and so on, uh, especially AIM, Agency Innovation Malaysia, under the Prime Minister Department. But still, commercialization and so on is like that also. I don't see much improvement. And why? Uh, we have to ask all these questions, why? But honestly, <coughs> the immediate thing that the UC can do is if there's a way to commercialize their research output. There are thousands of research that's been done in the universities. Thousands of products, <coughs> but they are not going to the market at all. The professors are happy to be promoted from CBA and that's it. But they, re they will realize that actually we have spent so much public money and yet it comes to nothing other than research papers. Commercial development on university online. University public uses have thousands of acres of land. When I went to Jolalongkorn University, they have seven supermarkets, you know, in Bangkok. <coughs> you know that or not? And not only that, they have 1,400 commercial lots. And from all this, Jolalongkorn <coughs> is only supported 30% from the government. 70% are all income from this. I was surprised that they have done this 30 years ago. They did this 30 years ago. Tula Long Kong Nusi. And I think that is a great example. You want to see how they have done. I think they are masters in building property and uh, uh, creating revenue for themselves. And in Bangkok, there's another very good university too called Mahidol University. Have you heard of that? They own five public hosp uh, private hospitals. And the five uh, private hospitals, again, has enabled them to only uh, receive 30% of government, 70% is from that income. <coughs> so actually, and when I was vice chancellor, I've taken some board members and the top management to visit these two universities and to get an explanation how it's done. <coughs> but of course, nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> But, look, honestly, I'd like to invite people who want to know how we can create income, alternative income for universities. Go to our northern neighbor, Jolalangkorn and Mahidro, fantastic. Okay, healthcare and health products. So, and this for universities who have a hospital like UM, UPM, UPM and so on. You can create your, just like what Mahidro has done, uh, your private wing, enlarge it you know, and manage it properly <clears throat> and price it such that it's not as expensive as uh, some of the very established private hospitals and you'll make money. And you know that it's always the case where if the private hospital cannot do anything with the patient, they say go to the public hospital. You know? So if you have to end up going to the public hospital, that means the private hospital cannot do anything with you anymore. Okay. So there's a big market for this. And not only that, under medical tourism, the government is planning that it should be one of the big income earners too. Okay? <clears throat> and uh, in the medical faculties and science faculties of all these universities that has got this faculty, there's been a lot of research done too. And there's been a lot of innovative products too, you know, but it's just not going out. Agriculture and plantation. This is one area where I think universities can make money. I mean, a, a simple, small example is the University of Malaya. It has 1,000 acres of palm oil estate in, in Johor. Uh, that has consistently, in the last 15 years, given positive income to the University of Malaya. Of course, now with the commodities very low, it has gone down. But it has always given you a good income. And when I was busy, I had this idea that instead of 1,000, let's increase it to 50,000 because we can get 50,000 acres of land. <clears throat> so, Sunway University, go out and get 50,000 acres and plant, I don't mean palm oil, but there are so many other crops to be planted. I mean, uh, these are strange, strange crops that you, 
you never believe that you can make a lot of money. I mean, I gave you one crop which uh, currently uh, I know somebody is looking for a big piece of land to plant. If they want to plant a, a tree called Jabon, have you heard of this? It is for making uh, plywood. <coughs> And why this company is looking for this? Because they want to locate their plywood factories in US to Malaysia. <coughs> why is this happening? Because of TPPA. There will be no tax. Doing it in Malaysia will be cheaper. And Malaysia can produce jabon. And jabon can be used for making plywood. Can be making uh, for veneer and so on. And the biomass waste can be turned into coal and biodiesel. Suddenly, this has become a big opportunity. You know, so and jabon can be harvested after three to four years, so it's a very fast, uh, you know, growing tree actually. So, and to buy fifty thousand acres of land in Malaysia is it expensive or cheap? Cheap or expensive? For public, you see, they can get it free of charge, you know that? <laughs> yes, for Sunway you have to pay a bit, lah, I think. But public you see can get it free of charge. So if you can get fifty thousand free of charge, why don't you do it? But you know, with all due respect, those people in the board of the public is all frozen. You know, they, they, <laughs> <clears throat> I don't mind if any one of them listens to this talk. I'm telling them they are frozen because they are not willing even to explore beyond you know the normal thinking. You know? But honestly, uh, agriculture and setting up plantation is big, big money. And that company I know that's looking for 100,000 acres, wants to plant this uh, jabon, and will be for 60 years. They want the lease of the land for 60 years. For 60 years, our worries are over. And not only that, this American company told me, if we do that, after three or four years, we can lease the company, and the company will be worth $10 billion. You can put all the Malaysian universities into debt, isn't it? <laughs> and everybody will be... All the financial problems in the public will be sorted out, isn't it? $10 billion once it's listed in the New York, New York Stock Exchange. Okay? <clears throat> now, I'm saying this not from my own uh, creativity. It is an American company that is telling me this. So, if... Ever we, you know, the public university boss or the vice chancellor have any idea, what they can do is go and speak to the <coughs> chief minister of some states who has got big pieces of land. Actually, 100,000 is nothing for some states, especially Sarawak, you know. And do a JV with the American company, give the land for free. And then for 60 years, after the third or fourth year, they'll be sharing that billions, you know. So you see how actually we can easily do this. And there's no risk, you know what? You give it to the company to do everything. The company will put a few hundred million to develop the whole piece. What do you see? They got the land free. Good idea. Maybe Southern Cross may want to come over <laughs> and try this formula. <laughs> Renewable and alternative energy. There, there are so many projects in energy because energy is one of the you know, one of the key areas that people are involved in this and there are so many products, but still they don't get to the market. Okay, this is the problem, you know. Online tertiary education, distributed campuses. Uh, I think, given the cuts and so on, <coughs> uh, it, it will serve well for many of the private industries to go along this line. They, they cannot build big campuses with big pieces of life. Impossible. And, and, and the biggest mistake of any private industry is to start off by building expensive campuses and after that they have to start paying the loan for the next I don't know 30 40 years and and you have all these problem like budget cut you will survive anymore and so many private universities have got stuck in this kind of problem you know all the private university I mean especially those that are government linked <coughs> Uh, University Technology Patronas, University Technology National have spent more than a billion ringgit. Until doomsday, you cannot pay that. You know, there's no way you can pay those loans, and which means they will be bleeding all the time. And you ask the CEOs of the Technology National and Patronas, 
the CEO, they will say how I wish that they don't have me. They don't build the Isuzu in the first place. It's too costly for them. So, so I hope you understand what's the problem with all this. But if you build online tertiary education with distributed campuses, like, you know, <clears throat> I've seen universities in the US, like Temple University and, and so many other universities, they are just shop lots, you know. The Department of Architecture at Cambridge University is actually in an old dilapidated house, you know that? What is one of the top ranked Department of Architecture in the world. When I visited that many years ago, I didn't believe that, eh, the Department of Architecture is inside here. But it is a top rank, isn't it? Why can't we do at some dilapidated house here? <laughs> some old departments. <laughs> and, uh, you know, <laughs> very cheap. Why can they do it in Cambridge? Why can't we do it here? Right? Uh, anyway, you tell me why cannot. You know? Upskilling and skills training program. <clears throat> Currently, there are a lot of workers out there which is not skilled yet. They have the necessary requirement to be upskilled. That means these are people who may have left uh, school after Form 5 and so on and went out to do apprenticeship and so on. But they have been working for 15, 20 years and so on. They have reached some supervisory level and commanding some people under them. In countries like Australia, UK, Canada, South Africa, these people can be given uh, a level 4 diploma, an academic diploma. But yet there are a very big percentage of such people in this country that doesn't have it. And I'm involved in one of the upskilling program and I'm delighted to see that uh, those who are aware of this program, those who went through it, they get their level 4 diploma and, and how refreshing, how re-motivated and how they are beginning to progress again in life. So this is, uh, I think, good business to be done by universities too. You know? Because uh, I'm sure 80-90% of the university wants to do high level research, but we can also serve society by helping the, the workforce to be upskilled. Okay? Okay, uh, I, I mentioned just now, this is what I, I mean, plant jabon on 100,000 acres of land, list it in the New York Stock Exchange, do it with established partners, of course, you know, and, and, and I know people who are already doing it now, and you can solve this very quickly, your, your financial problem. And actually, uh, we have one problem here in Malaysia, we don't seem to be properly internationally networked, because if we have very good networking internationally, we know where we can raise funds. You know, it is possible, especially in research. We can get a research money funded by Hong Kong, China, and all this if we have the proper connection. And uh, when you go to university, you will meet hundred academics. Ninety-five percent of them will tell you there's no money, difficult to do research. But there will be a few who never has any problem with any money. In fact, they will tell you, I have too much money. <laughs> so look for these 5% of people who will never have any problem in raising money. And I tell you, I know academics who get a lot of international funds and can't even finish using those money. You know? If you want to know these people, come and contact me by email. <laughs> So, in a sustainable education hub, roughly it must look like this. Okay, there must, there must be money coming in from various sources, including international funds, human capital, the best, you know, the best brains must come in, students and stuff. Uh, governments, some government support definitely for infrastructure and so on. <clears throat> but what must come out of it are these things. And these things, products will produce money and so on. This, this should be the overall concept lah, you know. Uh, research cannot just end at research, okay, and, and, and does not produce anything after that. Sorry. Okay, sustainable education hub, there must be existence of autonomous top class world rank universities and the nation is really talking about so many top universities and so on, which we must do quickly. And we need uh, political will to actually force this to all the universities, but which I think the government 
is being very diplomatic on these things. But I think since uh, a lot of things are happening now, the government must even be more forceful to force this, and not only to public university, even to private universities. Okay. Environments that attract top uh, global global top academics and quality students. We have problem in attracting quality students, but even top academics that we bring into the country, <coughs> uh, are they happy or not? You know, uh, uh, are they are they happy to be here forever or not? And, and not like Lauren was always telling me that she wants to go back to Philippines because she's quite homesick. So we must have a system that makes people happy to stay. People welcome are uh, welcome to this country, and so on and so on. Funds available to support research and academic activities. So under a situation where a lot of cuts are being made, so we need to have innovative people who knows where to go and look for the money. You know, at the end of the day, now I think at the end of the day, it all boils down to this: we need people under the current circumstances where it's so bleak and so on, but still knows where to find the money. We need people like that. And if we can find people like that, pay them well more than the vice chancellor. Right or not? Okay. There are people who can go out there and get money for the universities. There are. Okay. Ah, there must be opportunity for employment, startups and internships, just like in the Silicon Valley. They can work and they can even start up their companies and so on. And in the Silicon Valley, if I'm not mistaken, a lot of startups are started by 40% of them by Indians, you know, who came from India. <coughs> Isn't that interesting? It's not by the whites, but by Indians, the, the big numbers there. Global networking and collaboration is important. <coughs> Active innovation, commercialization and revenue generation. Now, this is the part I will talk a bit after this. There must be real interaction with the industry community because at the moment I think a lot of industry are just in the business of making money but they are not very close with the university. They don't do much with the university. And we must find out why this is happening. Excellent academic and entrepreneurial uh, leadership and I must say that I know <coughs> so, so many of the public university vice chancellors and so on, they have no clue uh, in terms of uh, being an entrepreneur, the, the best that they have done in life may be buy two houses, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and after two houses, they stop. They have done well, I think. You know? In future, I think we should appoint a vice chancellor who has like at least half a million ringgit in his bank account, at least own uh, ten properties. Okay. <clears throat> This should be the qualification of the vice chancellor of the future. Don't you agree? No. You will be wondering which vice chancellor has got this, isn't it? <laughs> but I think we need vice chancellor who can do that sort of thing. Right or not? If he himself can only buy two bungalows at the age of 50, do you think he's done well in that? What do you think? I mean, let, let's be serious about this. I want you to answer this question. <clears throat> Has he done well as a university leader? And is that the kind of leader we want? If by the age of 50, when he becomes vice chancellor, he only owns two houses. Okay. Huh? I think he should not be judged in that manner. <laughs> I'm curious why you're asking how many wives. <laughs> If you have four wives with two houses, then it's not good. Yes. <laughs> so you must have at least four. Oh. <laughs> but again, the serious question is, do you think a vice chancellor, a Malaysian vice chancellor, who owns two houses by the age of 50 when he becomes a vice chancellor, he has done well? Here the question is, he's not a businessman. He's not yeah. a vice chancellor. Yeah. So if you are trying to raise a businessman as a vice chancellor, it's totally out of contact because a vice chancellor is never a businessman. He's getting a salary. Sir, in the US, the number one job of the president of the university is to raise money, sir. You know that? The number one job of the vice president, uh, the president is to raise money. The one who talks about research and, and, and how to build up academic programs one is the provost, the number two man. That's normally the case. <clears throat> so this country, if we want to face all these cards with the economic problems, we need a vice chancellor who was excellent in his academy, 
but must be a good business businessman too. Do you agree with this or not now? Yeah. We don't need vice chancellors who are very good at their teaching, their research and stop there. They'll be talking things out of point, irrelevant to the age. <laughs> don't you agree? Yeah. Uh, so this I think is true. Prof, I don't know whether you agree with that or not. <laughs> because you look at me like <laughs> I'm getting worried. <laughs> Again, we need a new kind of university leader today. We need a leader who is excellent in his academic track record, in his teaching, in his uh, networking, plus entrepreneur. And to know whether the vice chancellor is an entrepreneur or not, ask him to declare whatever he has done. <laughs> Including like Prof. Hussie's wives. <laughs> ask them to declare everything. If he is able to have quite a lot of property or money in the bank account or I don't know, like Prof was thinking maybe a few wives that is a very entrepreneurial man, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it's not him, you know, it could be the wife who is very entrepreneurial. Yeah. <laughs> if that is the case, I will still think he should be the president <laughs> because the wife can be the problem. <laughs> But, but this is like a crazy idea, but I think there is one way forward. We cannot have a totally academic vice chancellor, no more. We cannot move. Really. And then there's a consensus today. Right, bro? <laughs> You're beginning to shake your head now. <laughs> that, I think, is number one. And not only that, the board members, the board members who will eventually tell the vice chancellor, yes, I agree with this proposal or I disagree and so on, must have that mind also. Don't you think so? Yes. So we should set a KPI for them? I think so. <laughs> so. So this is one thing that I'm strongly for now, that we must have university leaders who are not just excellent academics. And I think this should also apply to the private universities. Don't you think so? Yeah. Yes, I think it should be. If not, the, 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 the private university is in an even worse situation. They don't get funding at all from the government. Yes, sir, you want to ask something? But, uh, looking at education, actually, ah. if, we, if we go in the context of providing uh, what you call knowledge and, uh, so that they can gain from the, with the knowledge that they have, they go out with experience to become able citizens. Uh, I think the most important thing right now is that when we talk about all these changes, is that we need to change the leader. We need to have a leader that has the leadership ability to show us the direction of how we should go. That leader in place who can actually lead the country uh, to show us the way, then I think the problem will be solved. Because the leaders are blind. The leaders are yeah, blind. But you see the thing, the people, the leaders should be actually from the people actually. So if we talk about a partyless society whereby the next election can be uh, funded by the people. Then we will have very good people coming forward like you and all those NGO leaders and all. And all these will be the ones that the people will be exposed to to stand for election to become the wise people in parliament. I don't know. You see, we all are trying to give education to our children and we tell our children that to be uh, extra active in extracurricular activities, to build up their own leadership ability and all. But we are not giving them the chance to come up. We don't give them a chance to come up. And as a result, they will just follow what they are studying. And then it's just, they see that, see, those people who excel are not the one having education. I mean, successful okay, ones. Could you I mean, they, bring the to a stop because he hasn't finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> that my talk is not boring like <laughs> But actually, I will just say one thing. I totally agree with you. We need good leaders. The country is now so short of good leaders. Absolutely, I agree. But problems are not a politician. <laughs> So I will talk to the academics and the UC presidents, but I can't really say much about the country, but I absolutely agree with you, sir. Absolutely, no question about it. Okay, I have to go on because Prof. Who is already standing. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we need the innovation economy. In other words, from your research results, you get products. That product must end with 
making money. That's all. This is what this guy is all about. And this is so illustrate that one. Because problems are this very. <laughs> Challenges in realizing the innovation economy. So this particular report by this body, Southeast Asia European uh, Network, tells us what is the problem with this country. Okay, the lack skill level, stagnant R&D, low level entrepreneurship and venture capital, poor tech record, internal political visions, coherent policies, and so on. These are the problems in this country. How do we solve this? Sir? Difficult, isn't it? Huh? Let me tell you how we will solve it in a minute. So I'm just listing again from that official report what are the problems in this country. These are the problems in this country. <coughs> okay? And let me just tell you that actually the budgets of some of the big uh, global companies, they are more than what nature is spending on R&D. It's quite amazing like what sort of them, how much they spend and so on. Yeah? And to, be, to survive and become a leading economy in the world, we need to generate companies that can do this sort of thing in future. You know? uh, because if we are not able to build companies that can, can do this sort of thing, we are not going to be the uh, winner in future. And of course, if we look at how we spend uh, our, our money on, as percentage of GDP, money on research, Israel is so high, 4.2. Okay, and Malaysia is somewhere here. Ah, 0 0.8. You compare to Israel, Korea, Japan, it's staggering. So, so at this point, uh, I know the budget for research and so on and, uh, will also still be, be cut. So, so we have to find innovative ways lah, how we can still do good research. And this has to include uh, sourcing from external grants and so on from outside of Malaysia. And uh, I, I'm just summarizing here on things that I've said before, which is issues of academic excellence, because uh, a lot of academics still don't understand what academic excellence is. If you ask them to do good research, publish in all the index journals, some of them is still defying those uh, yeah. uh, orders. <coughs> institutional leadership, that's what we were talking about now, meritocracy. Uh, I mean, it is said that at least we still get straight A students who cannot get to the good universities. And they end up doing in, end up doing courses which they don't even want in the first place. It's still happening in this country and honestly, our government must really solve this because I think it's the cause of a lot of unhappiness actually. But the government must solve that because you know or not, the truth about student intake to the public is it's all decided by the Ministry of Higher Education. That is the truth. Even though they say meritocracy, but I tell you, they decide it. Especially to uh, courses like uh, medicine, dentistry, uh, pharmacy, uh, <coughs> accounting, law. These are highly demanded programs, but actually the Ministry decided not me as a vice chancellor before you know? and and so on i don't want to i don't want to uh, go over this because i'm really running out of time <coughs> oops okay let me just talk about this attempt on how to speed up innovation because at the end of the day what i'm telling you is that one of the things that we can do is to get involved in making sure our products get to the market right so <coughs> Uh, an entity called the Nation uh, uh, Innovation Hub has just been set up by a group of private businessmen who has money to spend. Businessmen is not funded by government, but this entity is uh, uh, set up uh, under the purview of the Ministry of Higher Education, but privately funded. No, not a single cent from the government. <clears throat> okay. Uh, there is a board of trustees, and after some months, they decided to ask me to be the chairman. I don't know why. <coughs> anyway, since they asked me the chairman, I do my best as a chairman. Okay, what does this do? We want to do, we know there are plenty of research, there are plenty of products there. <coughs> so what this entity does is that it goes to all the universities and asks, hey, show me your research finding. 
So we go to the professors, not on their own. Let me see your research. And we have a guy who can see this product and say, okay, look, I want to take this, I want to take this, and so on. So it's not many. Uh, the first round when they did this exercise, they found 50, about 50 products where they say, yes, we can market this. And what else does the Malaysian Innovation Hub does? It links them to private companies who are interested in those products. Second. And thirdly, what does it also do? It is able to link up with some international funders who can even fund further research on it to product to, to develop the product. Right. So again, it is different in the sense that it goes and look for products that companies want, link up with companies, companies take it up, companies manufacture it in, in, and sell it to the market, or they arrange with international funders to further develop the product and sell it. Okay? So it's a different role, right? Because before this, you may have AIM, Agency University Malaysia. They are there, but very few interaction with the university. Mm -hmm. But this one is, this businessman goes out and look for the projects. These are very, these businessmen are very, people with very noble heart. Lah. You know, they really want to help the university. So this has been set up. Currently, it has gone to all the public universities, and soon it will go to the private university as well to look for research result, research products, and to help them to commercialize. So honestly, if this MIH strikes big, this is one solution for the cuts in the budget at the public university. Okay, so so this is one. Uh, one thing that may help, and let us all pray for the success of this MIH. You know, it is different. It is privately funded. It gets no money from the government. It is being funded by a group of wealthy businessmen who want to help the universities, and it is called the National Innovation Hub. And and some of the projects that have been uh, identified where. They have already found business partners even who is willing to take it and sell it and so on are these products, you know, under these uh, <coughs> project headings, you know. Uh, so, so it is interesting, let, let me just give you one example. Uh, every year we have floods in the East Coast and Sabah, Sarawak. And one of the biggest problems during floods, they don't have clean water. So soon uh, the Malaysia Innovation Hub will get a contract where the government will purchase 8,000 units of such a unit uh, to be sent to all the rural areas and to the platform areas and uh, they will, the, the villagers will use this. Okay, I have to stop. <laughs> okay, and, and so many products. Uh, I can come back and tell some university professors in future like you want to know more about this. Uh, I think I mentioned this just now, so I won't, I won't uh, go into detail. The minister is saying that we are really an education hub. <laughs> but we have people like this who doesn't think so. It's for you all to believe who is right and who is wrong. But I think, I think with the budget problem, I think maybe I have to increase, make this be such a picture bigger now. <laughs> With the budget cuts, you know, because obviously this objective will be frustrated now. You know? Now, issues in public university, these have been the issues. Okay, <coughs> government guaranteed, protected, huge, these are not so sure anymore, huge funding, low tuition fees, and so on. The, what is not good, bureaucratic, very slow, directionless board. Uh, if you meet some of the boss, tell them I said this. I don't mind. Uh, board members are all appointed by the Minister of Education, including the Vice Chancellor and the Deputy Vice Chancellor. Every single one appointed by the government. So I think if the university gets into trouble, the government must answer because they appoint everybody. You know? Uh, when I was Vice Chancellor, I was appointed by the government also, but I suppose I'm lucky, like they forgot who I am, but never mind. But the board is really not doing much, you know. Honestly, uh, they put a senior civil servant normally who must be about 70 above, <laughs> and by the time they finish, the board is 80 something. Right? <laughs> and how much can you expect from them? Okay, 
and then they put board members who are during the meeting looking at their handphones or calling the wife or whatever. But I must tell you, there's a great difference with the board here in San Luis. I enjoy the board here. I must tell you, you know, I'm uh, that kind of very sluggish, very uh, you know, non-performing board is in the public universities. But the San Luis board, I'm always awake for three hours or so. You know? And, and you know, there's a big difference between private and public. I'm also a, a board member of Citibank, and that one is crazy. I can't even sleep. You, know. <laughs> you have to be awake all the time, and in my case, I really have to be awake because I don't even understand the banking terms. <laughs> but they are all intelligent people. In this uh, city bank board, I say, he's so intelligent, I say, I feel very small in this board. You know? And not only that, one by one, all the senior officials of the bank will be asked to come and present. My God, they really know their stuff. Of course, they are paid very well in American dollars. <clears throat> you know? So I can see a big difference in, in, in organization where it is performance-based and organization where everything is a political appointment. Big, big difference. If the University of Malaya board has a board like Citibank, I can tell you, it will turn around overnight. <coughs> Definitely. You know? And in the private universities, these are the issues. The problem is a lot of private universities that the owners normally are, they went into it because of financial motivation. You know, uh, A lot of them has only the university as its business. They don't have any other business. So, their rise and fall of their income is dependent on the university income. And so when they have big cut like this, they are in trouble for sure. But of course, uh, Sangwe has got so many other major business. They are looking more at the, the, the ag education business as a CSR, so that's fine. But their, their major income comes from other, other uh, <coughs> activities, you know. So, what would be the solution to all this? Honestly, if the minister asks me, I will tell him the same. Selection of top management and board members must not be made by the minister. It must be made by independent party which will seek to find the best people for the job. You know? The, the, the current way is just not on anymore, you know, under the circumstances. Visionary and capable leadership with business and entrepreneurial experience. Again, this was the issue that I was talking just now. Gone are the days where the vice chancellor is a very excellent academic and full stop. It must be ac academic who has got that plus business experience and networking and so on. It has to be that kind of human being. Okay. Uh, the board must not be a sleeping board. Car the current university boards are mostly sleeping boards. <laughs> BC, DBC board members must have performance target. At one time when I was the vice chancellor, I discussed with some board members, I wanted to introduce KPI to all the board members. He was very angry with me. <laughs> the KPI I want to put is, okay, each board member every year must bring in one million ringgit. That was just that was the beginning KPI lah that, that I wanted to put. Nobody agreed with that. You know. But if we can have that, it's good, isn't it? Mm. Uh, you know. uh, improve uh, financial capability with new business model. I've already explained this just now. Okay. And I think they should have their own autonomous scheme of service and not follow the government scheme. And this has been promised long time ago under autonomy. But they have never been able to do. Okay, greater staff and student mobility, and and this is what I have been explaining this now. And for the private industry, this is what I think it, uh, it must be transformed into a not-for-profit uh, organization because uh, if you are <coughs> under the current circumstances where everything is for profit, the government will not give you money. Uh, funding agencies will not be very keen to give you money because it is for the owners actually. It's not for not for profit, and I think a lot of the private industries must realign their vision, mission, and practices. Uh, uh, I think in this country, about ten to twenty percent of the private industries are okay, but eighty percent of them is not. 
They have to realign all this if they want to survive. And again, there are <coughs> dishonest practices within the private universities. Uh, I have run a private university before. I have also worked at a private college before. And I know many, many CEOs in the private college and so on. I wouldn't say that everyone was honest in doing their job. <coughs> you yeah. know? So, so I, think, I think there are serious issues with regard to integrity and so on. And this is where I think uh, if Lorraine was talking about corruption and so on, in my opinion, it happens also in higher education. You know? From what I've seen and what I've experienced. And I think government funding should be open also to the private institutions, not to the public. It all must be depending on their achievement, their KPIs and so on. Okay. <clears throat> and I think there should be one act that will combine everything, rather than two separate acts. At the moment, there are two separate acts, which is quite different one from the other, you know. And of course, uh, the, the private university also must, must not... Uh, just depend on student fees, they must create new new uh, revenue streams and so on. <clears throat> okay. Now, let me just finish by saying that uh, under challenging times like this, we need people who has vision, who knows what to do. And I think the government must be able to pick people who can actually sort out these problems now. Of course, the government is telling the universities to, to, to increase more income, huh? but how many can do it? Not many can do it, you see, and, and even if you keep on repeating this as much as you want, still they cannot do it. So it's about time we must find people who can actually perform and deliver. I think, I think it is that situation now, you know. And, and, and if we don't, we will see the disastrous consequences of the, the, the current economic climate in the country and the budget cuts and so on. Um, and, and, and I don't think uh, the, 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 the <clears throat> education hub concept is sustainable. I don't think it will be achieved. If we don't do something drastic, especially in selecting people who will be able to face the challenges now. So we need a new set of skills and ideas and so on in order to move forward. Thank you, Rob.